Hi, this is Johan Sapil Bhartia and we are here at Open Source Summit in Vienna, Austria. And today we have with us once again Arpit Joshi Pura, GM of Networking, Edge and IoT at the Linux Foundation. Arpit, once again, it's great to have you on the show. Always good to be here. It's, you know, it's my pleasure to talk to you. Uh, before we get started, let's just talk about, we are here at the event. Uh, it was raining, but today the weather is good. Mm -hmm. What kind of crowd, what kind of attendance did you see here? So we are seeing attendance and, and uh, people at the size of pre-COVID levels now. So that's really exciting. Um, almost everybody that I've met back to back has said one simple thing. The best part of the event is the face-to-face. -face. One-off meetings, we can actually meet and not just on a Zoom call. So along with the keynotes and the sessions, that's kind of the icing on the cake. And now let's talk about LF Networking's presence, your presence, your organization's presence here at the event. What kind of announcement, what kind of, just, just talk about your visibility here. Uh, so we were here uh, at the keynote. Uh, the big announcement, there were th three announcements. Uh, the first announcement, and again, I'm trying to do it in the Silicon Valley style, right? Like, let me tell you three announcements. Uh, the first one was uh, on Kamara. So Kamara release one. So for you know, Kamara is 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 one of the largest projects where we are we have finally figured out how to monetize this rich data that exists in the network and um, release APIs for the industry. Right. So Kamara release one has come out, and it has got some of the rich APIs already deployed by the Verizons and the De Deutsche Telekoms of the world. Um, and release one has come out. Simultaneously, there has been an announcement on a joint venture by you know, Ericsson plus 13 other telcos, the largest of them, forming a joint venture of a company that will actually help make this easy to, to provide these APIs anywhere in the world, any network, right? So that's announcement number one. Announcement number two is if you look at the end-to-end -end network, uh, one of the pieces is the mobile packet core. And we were pleased to announce that free 5GC, uh, which is one of the world's leading mobile packet core, is moving to the Linux Foundation. Um, so we're excited about that. Now we have you know, a lot of uh, uh, solutions that are custom for uh, packet core and mobile packet core that helps the end-to-end -end network from happening. And I think the third very important announcement that people kind of would, would look at just marketing hype is what I call domain-specific AI, okay? And the reason, you know, we're post-hype is in the last one year, all we have been hearing is, uh, you know, LLMs and, and models and, you know, generic chatbots and things like that, right? Great. I can ask it, I can do a chat GPT, I can do all these things as a user, but what can an enterprise do? What do domains, like whether it's a telecommunication domain, an energy domain, IoT domain, edge domain, agriculture, doesn't matter. What do they have to do? And so one of the things Linux Foundation Networking is focusing on is domain-specific AI. What that means is, what are the data sets that are important that come out from the networking networks globally? What are the data sets that I can then um, uh, obfuscate or actually uh, make sure that the, it doesn't go out as you know, uh, rich data, but I can still use the data and anonymize it essentially, right? And use it to train domain-specific models, right? So we have a project called Thought uh, in Linux Foundation Networking that is focusing on that. And then obviously the, the use cases and the applications that go in the domains that are relevant to the domain. So that's what Linux Foundation Networking is focusing on. I will go back to, uh, you mentioned uh, free 5GC. Uh, talk a bit about what it is and uh, why it matters that's moving under uh, LF umbrella. Uh, free 5GC is one of the world's leading packet core. It, kind of started off in Taiwan and, you know, end users like uh, Chonghua Telecom, et cetera, are all, all part of it. Uh, that open source packet core is, it was started quite a while ago. The reason it's moving to LF is 
um, it's ready to sort of scale globally. And we need the community to sort of uh, help beyond the, beyond the initial founders. That's number one. The reason it's important for the LF is we have um, you know, other mobile packet core solutions that are based on free 5GC. For example, under the uh, Aether project, there's something called SD Core, right? Uh, this, is the, um, this is the project formed from the ONF days that moved into LFN, uh, LF. Um, so, so now there is an easy way to collaborate and upstream downstream uh, relationship with the packet core. So that's kind of the main, main reason. And then the second is under LFN, uh, we have something called 5G Super Blueprints. And 5G Super Blueprints basically are a way to interoperate and test use cases in the real world end to end. And so what we have to do is take advantage of that framework and utilize some of these uh, open source projects and building blocks. And now I want to just go a bit deeper into the domain specific AI. Uh, talk a bit about, you, you did give some example, but I want to go, I want to look at it from the perspective or for the lens of LF networking. Okay. Uh, so if you look at, if you draw an architecture diagram uh, of, of the AI stack, for lack of a better word, right? I'll simply put it in four layers. There's the infrastructure layer below, right? Right at the bottom, network. That's where projects like Nephio and ONAP and Open Daylight and FIDE, all of them fit in. That network is already deployed globally. We have a lot of data that gets generated. And that, that currently has moved from sort of a very fixed rigid network to policy-based and now intent-based network. So you've heard the word intent. You don't need to know the details, but if you specify an intent, the network will understand. And then there are control loops that say if something bad happens or if some changes happen, you know the intent so you can automatically fix it. But you can't learn from it. So what domain-specific AI helps you do is take that data, right, use it to learn and train the models so that next time you don't rely on a policy or on an operator or a user to make the changes adjusts itself, right? Whether it's bandwidth on demand or links moving out or, you know, whatever, QoS, et cetera. Uh, so that's all work done within LFN. Now, the second two tiers are really generic. So that's how you do AI uh, generic models, LLMs, how you do um, uh, compute, and how you do data sharing, generic, okay? No issues there. And then on the top, you have domain-specific models. So these are LLMs with both RAG and fine-tuning, right? Because you can actually utilize a lot of learnings from the domain and train your models to help your domain. Uh, you know, and again, I can't go into all the details in such a short time, but effectively, the next big wave that we are seeing is these domains focusing on how they can utilize AI for network and how they can utilize the network for AI. And can you talk about domain-specific AI from the perspective of the LF networking projects? You know, it, it, so yeah, I just want to go not in detail of the workings, but uh, is it more or less like, I want to understand is that are there any specific projects that will be offering that or is more yeah, or less so like there, there enabling a, that? Like, so an example of a project is called Thought under the project Anuket, uh, which has been an LF networking project. But this, what this project does is it anonymizes the data that can be used for training. So, so it's kind of very interesting because now uh, the biggest concern was the security and the privacy of data, right? That you train the models on, right? And, and, and as you know, you know, in these generic public cloud models, you can't just, uh, corporations are blocking people to just like write code or write, you know, send data for training. Uh, so this project allows you to do that without the risk of, of uh, privacy. So it's more or less like these projects are enabling the enabling, enabling, the, enabling yeah. yeah. And at the end of the day, we're not going to have like a brand new LLM, right? But what we can do is we can take what LLMs are relevant, add 
modifications with sort of rags or fine tuning, which are domain specific, and then utilize it with the data that exists. Right, so that's kind of one focus. The other focus on LFN was the, um, our governing board and our community did a survey on, uh, and our, uh, by the way, LF networking is basically who defines the net telecom market, right? And the enterprise market. It, it's basically eight of the top 10 telecom service providers and cloud service providers and the top, you know, 10 of 10 vendors, if you may, supporting it. And they did a survey of what's, what are the domain specific AI use cases. So we have a list of the top five and the operators are implementing those five use cases, right? Most of them are in the, uh, uh, in the service domain. Uh, there are a few in the slicing, a uh, few in a RAN optimization domain, et cetera. So there's, there's a list, there's a white paper that has been published on, on that, uh, which you can download as well. Uh, now, uh, this is going beyond LF networking and open source. Uh, how is the telco space evolving? Because now we also have consumer grade Starlink, you know, satellites. Uh, telcos evolve over time when they move from black boxes to white boxes, from proprietary to open source. So, what kind of evolution? I'm not talking about even 6G and other innovation, but I'm talking about these new kind of, you know, mechanisms emerging to bring internet to home where they are collaborating with T-Mobile and even in the airplanes, you know, United Airlines will be getting through this. So how is it affecting the telco space and what role do you see of open source and LF networking in this space? Excellent question. Uh, what has happened is 3GPP actually has a release that focuses on NTN. So it defines how uh, satellite communications with mobile communications sh should work. Protocols, handover, transfer, the whole nine yards, right? So what we're seeing here is the implementation of some of that handoffs and some of the uh, specifications from 3GPP, okay? So it's not new, it's happening. Uh, it's just going to the implementation, right? At the macro level, there will be multiple types of accesses, okay? So I'll start off with the most common mobile broadband access, which is ORAN, right? 3GPP, mobile broadband, cellular phone. We know that how that works globally, and we know how to solve that. NTN is the next one, right? Uh, terrestrial access, satellite access, right? So there's a lot of startups that are popping up. Uh, from an open source perspective, we are seeing some of the API work that's getting done. There are some projects that we are looking into that will help uh, drive this even faster. Um, so that's that access. Then we have the broadband GPON access. So we have projects called LF Broadband, under which we have Volta and Seba project. This is from the ONF uh, merging into, or moving into LF. Um, that project is deployed in likes of Deutsche Telekom, Turk Telecom, et cetera, where you have an open source based XGS PON, right, or PON, passive optical network. So that's another access. Now there could be uh, coming into an edge with fixed wireless access, right? So what I'm trying, and then of course there's the T1 fiber private line uh, enterprise access, right? Directly, private networks, all of those things. And then the rural fixed wireless access through broadband. Then there could be, uh, you know, 60 gigahertz ter ter uh, ter uh, access, right? So we have under LF connectivity, we have projects like Teragraph that bring that in. My point being, access will always be fragmented and customized to the need of the end user, the end device, and the situation. Edge and core need harmonization and unification of frameworks and software. So that's our strategy and our vision of how we pull it together. I know it's a long answer, but I wanted to explain the whole thing. No, no, I actually uh, uh, appreciate, you know, in detail. Um, anything else, anything specific from the, any emerging use case that you are seeing where you are like, hey, this is the bottleneck and that's where LF networking or open source can solve the problem? Uh, I would say the next, uh, like 
AI obviously is the next year, year and a half to solve. So I've talked about that. I think the big, um, big area that we are focusing on beyond that, I, I mean, along with that is obviously open source security that started last year. So we have OpenSSF that governs all the open source projects. So they're all secure. Um, and that, and so, so between security and AI on the open source front, uh, it will keep us busy. The next big thing between now and next year is getting the RAN fully open source. So today, only the interfaces are open source, right? So if you look at Open RAN, their architecture defines seven blocks. Four of them are open source based, right? So the SMO and the uh, RIC and the near real time RIC and the uh, the the, uh, the the OCloud, etc. This is all open source, right? Based on several components from from um, from um, uh, from on the ONF days, from Open OS Oranalan software community, from ONAP, etc. Right. So all that is exists. CUDU and RU are the three components that are not open source. They are open, but not open source. And we're working on them to see what we can do to enable those things to be open source so that we can innovate faster. Arpit, once again, thank you so much for joining me today and uh, you know, great insights about where the market is, where we are heading. And I would love to have you back on the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.